You're listening to The Vint Podcast, where we bring you interviews and stories from around the world of wine and spirits. From winemakers and critics to sommeliers and master distillers, we'll explore the people and businesses who are instrumental in shaping the future of today's food and drinks culture. Enjoy the show. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of The Vint Podcast. My name is Brady, joined in the studio by Billy Galanko. Billy, we're both wearing, uh, for those of our listeners on um, on YouTube, we're both wearing like a pleated sweater. Quilted, if you will. Quilted, yeah. Not Would I say pleated? Yeah, yeah that's not right. <laughs> quilted. <laughs> quilted sweater. Um, pleated pants, quilted sweater. That's actually funny on the pleated side. I was watching um episode of Seinfeld the other day. Do you know Seinfeld? I, I've heard of it, yes. It's yeah. Oh, you've heard famous. of it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> The one where um, Kramer learns from the conductor how to not get a crease in your pants and how to keep the pleat in your pants before you're like going to a nice event. You just take them off and you like hang them up on a hanger. And so you lounge around in your underwear until you're ready to go. So nice. the pleat doesn't go away in the pants. But um, we're, we're continuing the theme that you're younger than me, but you know more older things than I do. So that's <laughs> interesting. <laughs> older wine preferences, older TV show preferences. <laughs> Nice. Well, uh, how was how was your weekend? Um, you have anything unique or interesting to drink? Let's see. Um, had some whiskeys. What were you drinking? Um, I feel like I talked about whiskey too much on the podcast. It's just what I've been drinking more because my wife's pregnant, and so there's a higher cost to opening a bottle, <laughs> not having mm. someone to drink to drink it with. So I've been drinking more whiskeys. Of course, that is a good um, ad for Coravin. I should be using my Coravin a little bit more and <laughs> um, getting, getting a glass of wine out of my closed bottles. But um, actually, yeah, I won't talk about the whiskeys I had. Um, I picked up some Irish cream. I've been wanting Irish cream for my coffee for a while now. Haven't pulled the trigger, picked up a little bottle. Uh, 14 bucks, keeps in your fridge for six months. Really delightful way to end an evening. Nice, nice. Um all right, well then I'll talk about mine a bit. I've had, I had a, a like a red wine little adventure this weekend. Um, wasn't a goal, but it ended up being the result. Um, so I did use my Corvin um, one evening. I actually have been Corvining um, the farm, the big game that they sent me over oh, a long period of time. Yeah, that was really good. Um, it's it's shown well every time. It, it's a perfect wine to uh to corvin too because a little bit of air gets in over time corvining mm-hmm. but it's just been allowing it to develop nicely um since i've been drinking it so nice. it's been great i've had a glass every in like week or weekend or so um but then following that we went to a newer well it's not newer but new to me um wine and cheese and tin fish uh establishment downtown here in la and it's interesting it's called kippered k-i-p-p-e-r-e-d um and I had heard about it originally on Marketplace on NPR. Um, I know you mentioned you you might not kind of listen, but for our listeners, basically, uh, in the well, in the mornings and the evenings, but in the evenings, um, NPR has a segment called Marketplace. The host is Kai Rizdal. He's actually based here in LA. Um, and part of what they do is like a small business segment. They interview people throughout the country who are just trying to make buy make it on a, a small business. And this lady had come on a couple of times. She's a cheesemonger. Um, she was originally in this kind of um it's called grand central market it's basically a place with like food stalls and she had been there for a while um with dtla cheese and then mm-hmm. when the pandemic came uh downtown la kind of took a little step back in terms of like vibrancy and, and, and population and a lot of stores had to close um so she had the opportunity to make that a standalone the cheese shop a standalone shop which is now dtla cheese shop and then next door they opened this kippered which is also serviced by the cheese shop. So they have cheese from the cheese shop, but then they focus on tin fish and sparkling wine as well as other still wines. Um, so I'd heard about it months ago. I think I mentioned it to me um, at the time. She was really not into going down to downtown. Um, it's gotten much, it's, it's bounced back really well from COVID since then. So we were down there um, and it was really cool. Um, the owner, uh, I, she basically worked she was behind the counter helping us like describe like the wines and the cheese. I think her husband was also there um, who also is a co-owner. Um, and it was really cool. I had wine wise started out with a chilled dolcetto, which is one of those grapes from Piemonte. That's a nice, yeah. easy drinking um, 
and those sometimes they can be very simple. This one was really unique and complex to me. Um, is as much as a dolcetto can be. There was there's some depth to it. Um, so it was actually nice even as it warmed up. Um, and then I had a Lambrusco as well, um, which was a hundred percent Ruberti uh, grapes, which is um, interesting to me. Um, it's not one of the more common Lambrusco varieties, so that was cool. Um, also, that was it was like what you would think of a, a quality Lambrusco is kind of dark cherries. Um, you know, it wasn't, wasn't too light, but had a nice acid backbone. And then um, one wine that I had that you might find interesting. I can't remember the producer. Uh, maybe I'll look it up real quick, but it was a dry Creek, uh, like 2018 or 2019 wine that was made in a very dry Creek style. Um, it was Zen. I think it had some cab. Um, there's another variety. I'm, it's, I'm blanking on it right now, but it was 15.6 alcohol, um, which was quite the quite the big boy. You said it was Zinfandel. Most it was a, a majority. The first grape they listed was Zinfandel. It's like Zinfandel Cab and something else. It could have been Petite Syrah or something like that. Yeah. Um, it was a giant wine, but it was a few years old, and we had it when we had the cheese. Um, so, and I also asked her, and I got a half pour, so you know I didn't have to drink a whole glass of. 15.6% mm -hmm. alcohol. Um, but it was really neat because like she was able to explain the that that time we had gotten some cheese. We had a, a goat milk or a goat cheese and um sheep's cheese with like these interesting pairings and bread. But she was able to explain to me the cheese on like or us, I um, mean, I on such a complex level. It was like I realized now like it was the same level of stuff that I explain wine to people on. Like we started here and then we slowly and then we like we're like reaching the the bounds of like what I even comprehended, but I loved it because I was like, she was just so passionate about it. And uh, I was learning like left and right. And then luckily she said they were going to have cheese classes where they explain more of the process and how oh, they end cool. up the way they do in um, January. So it was a really cool, cool experience. Um, and the wines paired really well with their, with the cheese. And obviously the cheese did, was great. Did you have any fish? Uh, not this time. No, we um, may had actually had tin fish earlier in the day, the week. So mm -hmm. we, She's kind of tin fished out. It tends to be more her thing than mine, the tin fish. Yeah. Um, but one thing that was cool about the cheese, one was from Indiana. And I was like, how did you like, how do you source this cheese? Clearly you're here. I was like, is there a cheese conference? She's like, yes, there was a cheese conference. I met this lady <laughs> at the cheese. <laughs> and she's like, oh, then she went. Oh, yeah. I was yeah. like, oh, of course, there's a conference for everything. And then she went on to tell us about how this lady was like the OG, like, master or like boss of like american cheese like really brought cheese into its own over the past like 40 years but she's still alive so she's like yeah i got to actually like meet like the legend so it's like basically like i don't picture like um like mandavi back in the day like right after he he found this whole thing and if if you could just go and right now and he's still just walking around you know exclaiming you know what's great about napa valley is she's basically it's like the same thing so i thought that was a really cool story as well that she gets to kind of meet her her american cheese icons um, LA has got to be the only city in the country where you could open a wine, cheese, and tin fish shop downtown and survive. They're in like <laughs> Brooklyn, probably. Huh? Yeah. Maybe in Brooklyn. Yeah, I'm just thinking that New Yorkers would be like, no, on that. But well, you'd be you'd be interested. I mean, I don't, I don't know exactly what downtown LA is not as popping as you would think. It's not like the hot spot to go normally. Yeah. Um, it's coming back and there's a lot of really good food places down there, but this one was actually on the corner of a little less. It's like, there was a building that was like getting constructed. And I actually used to go to this, um, planet fitness. When I first moved here, I would take the train downtown. So I was still trying to pretend like I lived in like New York or elsewhere. Um, and I'd walk by this corner and it was always, it was like a, maybe a grilled cheese place where the cheese place is now, but like, it wasn't that like amazing. And it wasn't that highly like trafficked, um, back then. Otherwise I would have noticed this um place so i think i think they got in at the right time i think that person couldn't stay afloat during the pandemic and they got in at a good time for pricing so um but i'm excited and it was it was a great atmosphere it was really well designed so anybody in la go to kippard or follow them at at get kippard on instagram um that was great and then to round out my weekend we ended up going to korean barbecue um, with some friends um that was cool we didn't have any wine there but we did go back to our buddy's house. He's also a sommelier. And we had some uh, quality Mencia from Ribera Sacra, um, which was really neat. Um, it had that perfect balance of Mencia. Um, that was basically kind of like earthy, but also still some like some nice fruit coming through. So it was nice and balanced, good acid. Um, highly recommend anybody check out Mencia's. They're a great value. 
and then um, ended with, well, had this probably interspersed with a Korean whiskey um, that was still labeled soju on the bottle. Um, you know, soju is kind of like mm-hmm. their distilled yeah. spirit. Like a rice spirit, um, right? Typically. But it yeah. turns out, and I had been watching a video before we actually went to K-Barbecue, that you could, well, during, number one, during the Korean War, um, and in other times of hardship, they were, they had to ration rice. So soju started being made from like uh, sweet potatoes and some other things, anything with basically a starch. Um, and apparently a long time ago, according to this website, it was also made by uh, wheat, like 100% wheat sometimes. Um, so I, I, look, I look at this thing and he called it a whiskey and I was like, are you sure? It says soju. Um, but I looked at the bottle. Um, it was called, hold on, I have it here. Uh, Jinmek Soju, Soju Poets Rock, and I was like, "Oh, it says 100% wheat," and then it was barrel aged for three years as well. So it literally wow. followed, you know, all the requirements to become a whiskey. Uh, and it was it was really cool. It was almost kind of spicy, um, in the same way that like some of the ryes that you and I have have chatted about and like are. Um, it definitely had that like sp- spicy, almost citrus note that like a high wheat bourbon might um so that was really cool nice yeah what are the uh wine pairings for korean barbecue is it like tokai and oak chardonnay i don't know if you'd add the tokai in there i mean maybe dry tokai and something high acid i think i would pair uh-huh. um potentially a riesling hey, i guess tokai maybe was the spice oh the korean, um, i was gonna say the korean it's not spicy no they definitely yeah. do have spiciness um but i mean if you're going to a traditional place they have beer and soju and that's that's what you drink okay you, so sparkling you like a you could <laughs> oh yeah yeah i mean that would be nice too i've just yeah. i've never seen a a korean barbecue place that also has wine i mean i'm sure they exist but like the ones that we go to are very traditional and i like to have like our, our buddy is korean and he can order and he knows everything that like the right stuff to get so we always go with him or at least i always go with with him um and he always gets the right stuff so i do whatever he says to do so, sounds like you found your business partner there's a <laughs> well, he, market demand you have an expert on the other side and you can add the wine perfect well he actually wants to open up a he, he's he worked in wine for a long time um mm-hmm. as in new york and out here um in the hospitality section so he actually wants to open like a a wine and cheese place in in the oc down where he lives more <laughs> he's been trying to convince nice. me to do that with him and i'm like oh i don't really want to work or run a shop but it sounds like a great idea <laughs> and then i told him about kippard and he's like that's it that's what i want to do but just down here yeah. so it's funny yeah nice, um, nice yeah um so I, I guess we'll circle back I, I talked about it already but i think the wine of the week or the what we're drinking this weekend it's actually not going to come out in the vent email but we will um it'll be mencia this week so if for those i just mentioned it but you can find the the best, most traditional expressions kind of from Northwest Spain. If you go inland from where Albarino is grown in Rio Spices, uh, there's a couple areas over there. One is called Ribera Sacra. Um, another one's called Bierzo. Uh, they make different wines in the regions, but Mencia is like a, a medium bodied red wine, uh, kind of like ruby in color, medium tannins. But the what I love so much about it is they have so much earthy character. Some have a little bit of um, barnyard sometime, but not really. It tends to be this like, really complex forest floor mushrooms uh like herbs spiciness backed by like some nice ripe whether it be like blackberry sometimes cherry um like fruit component um and then my my favorite part about them is you can find really quality expressions for like i mean probably close to 20 bucks um they they used to be under 20 but probably more um now but really quality wines a lot of the top producers from elsewhere in spain like in um, Roberto del duero and in some of those areas are actually coming out and, and building wineries there. So you can find some of the same producers um, making some great, great uh, Mencia. So that'll be the wine of the week. I think it's also great with Thanksgiving. If you guys are listening to this the day before Thanksgiving, you still need a wine that your your friends probably haven't heard of and will be surprised by. I recommend Mencia. Nice. Yeah. For some reason, also, I know it's not Mencia, but I had um, made me think of, the, I guess the M made me think of uh, Chateau Moussard getting a bottle mm-hmm. of uh, the red out, uh, you know, after all the recommendations that we had heard recently. Kind of I was eyeballing. Memory. Yeah, yeah, you should. I was eyeballing a bottle of 2012 white Chateau Moussard um, okay. like last weekend. It was at a shop 
And I, I'm still surprised that like that was like 80 bucks. And I was like, yeah, if I felt like buying it, that's such a good deal. Like it's just like the age Rioja that we find sometimes the white ones. It's just like, I'm sure this is an amazing wine. It's way better than half the other wines here that are 80 bucks. Um, so I'm happy they're carrying it. So yeah, I get I compliment I, the guy every time. I don't buy it though. <laughs> I went to a shop the other day that um had um a three uh, speaking of well we're I guess we're talking offline about salon, but we had a three pack there was a three pack of salon um in o in like a banded OWC, but like in the shop on the shelf for a thousand dollars a bottle. Mm. Um which I was definitely not a buyer at that price point, but I know that, that was a good price. <laughs> so I thought that was that was like my uh that was my window shopping find of the weekend in terms of value. <laughs> nice. Also, for those, I, we actually don't really go to Costco anymore. But for those of you who do go to Costco um, in the holidays, they'll sometimes source like really nice wines and actually have them at really good prices. I think a couple of years ago, there was a bottle of Sasakaya for, I don't know, it was like 280 or something, like a really good price for quality wow. vintage. Yeah. Um, in hindsight, I probably should have gotten it. Um, I had just really started working at Vint, so I didn't really know my my price points like that well um so, but i should have um but anybody keep an eye out when you're at costco just because it's there doesn't mean it's um a cheap one yeah i'm ex excited to stop at the costco when we go out to oregon in early december because we don't have wine at our costco's here oh really so, i'm gonna stop out yeah because they don't sell they don't sell alcohol at grocery stores in maryland That's any alcohol, right. like not even wine so yeah oh yeah hmm well interesting all right. Well, shall we get to our interview now? Cool. Yeah, sounds good. Do you want to do the intro? Or I can. Yeah, I will. I will do it. So, our interview this week is Julia Harding, um, MW, Master of Wine. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar, you may be familiar with Jancis Robinson. Uh, Julia is a very close coworker, both on the website and on a lot of the most famous books that Jancis is a part of. So, you guys were probably maybe if you didn't know her, you definitely knew the books. Um, a couple of the books are uh, The Atlas to Wine, um, Wine Grapes, and of course, The Oxford Companion to Wine. Um, and I can't remember exactly what the formal name of the atlas is. I think it's like the World Atlas of Wine. Um, but what's interesting to me is it was kind of like um, a life, not a lifelong, a wine lifelong um, opportunity to kind of speak with like an icon. Because my very first wine book ever, which I'll talk about it with her, was The wine, Atlas to Wine. This was even before I liked wine. Um, I just like maps, so I thought that was cool. Um, and then when I was studying for my exams, um, it was really important for me to have access to the Oxford Companion to wine, as well as wine grapes. So I would go to the the library in New York and actually check them out. And I wasn't very expensive at the time, so you weren't allowed to take them out. So I had to sit there like Jake Gyllenhaal and, and read the books while I was in the library. <laughs> Same library. Um, yeah, we did not burn any for warm. Chain, like chain to the shelf. Yeah. Yeah, no day after tomorrow weather, luckily, while I was there, but it was the exact same room in the same library. So I always picture him while I was studying. Um, but yeah, no, she's an amazing person. Um, so she started out uh, in linguistics um, and basically editing language books. Um, it's like how she described it. Um, and then she was just through sheer persistence. She reached out to Jancis Robinson um, over time as, as she got more and more into wine. She completed wine studies, kept reaching out to Jancis, trying to work with her um but it was helping in any way that she could um eventually passed her mw and then became part of jance's team both writing for the website helping publish uh, multiple editions now of the oxford companion to wine which the focus of this episode is on the fifth edition of the oxford companion to wine um which just came out i highly recommend everybody get it i think it was only like 50 bucks or so um not that that's only for some people but it is basically the go-to reference book for wine, but it's written in such an accessible manner. It's kind of organized like a dictionary A to Z, but inside there are a longer form article or blurbs on things, pictures, um, everything's written in a really unique and engaging way. Um, and all the, the things kind of reference other pieces in the book so you can really get a full picture of anything you're trying to learn about. Um, and then before I let Brady hop in here, my other piece that I learned in the interview that I thought was really cool is she kind of like me, actually, um, not that I'm comparing myself to an MW, <laughs> but uh, I like she started studying more about wine because she thought she would enjoy the wine more or enjoy the process of drinking more. Um, so she just wanted to learn more and more to enhance her enjoyment of the experience. And I think that's that's very much aligned with how I do it. I, I think 
for me, it's more interesting to like know exactly how the wine was made, where it came from and all that behind your glass um, rather than just drinking it. So I thought that was a really cool inspiration um, and kind of like a, a role model I, I would like to follow um, as well. Yeah, and she's she's a real writer's writer, I think, um, just in terms of the way that she approaches um, thinking about and presenting information um, around wine, especially in these volumes that you know we talk about in the podcast a little bit. Uh, these volumes that can get kind of um, like theoretical and heady and academic, especially when you're talking about like sort of an Oxford edition that's meant to be a reference. Um, so I really appreciate her I ideas on, you know, sort of bringing narrative into uh, the entries that they wrote for, you know, different topics within the book. Um, yeah. And just building out a story around wine that anyone could kind of pick it up, leaf through it and sort of get immersed which you really can't say that about every reference book. So really appreciate uh, the work on the Oxford Companions and, and just, yeah, her background that I think makes her stand out among other wine writers in the industry for sure. Mm -hmm. Yep. So I recommend everybody go check out the Oxford Companion of Wine. Also check out the Wine Atlas and Wine Grapes. Um, but yeah, fresh off the presses, the new Oxford Companion 5th edition. Check it out. And now without further ado, here is our interview with Julia Harding. All right, we are here with Julia Harding, Master of Wine. Thank you so much for joining today. It's a great pleasure. Yeah, no, I'm, I know we talked about it a little bit on our introduction here, but um, Julia is one of the masterminds basically behind a lot of my favorite wine books in the world. Um, so I actually have some here. I'll hold them up for the camera. But the Wine Atlas, which I have the newest edition here, um, was my like first wine book ever, actually, before I even got into wine, I just liked geography and maps. And in grad school, I just got a, an atlas just so I could look at it. Um, didn't really think I liked wine yet. And then I was telling um, Brady earlier, and you as well offline that when I was in New York, and actually started studying wine, um, I would go to the New York library and get both the Oxford Companion, which we're here to talk about the fifth edition today, and I have as well, and then also wine grapes, which is an amazing tome um or i don't know if it's considered a tome but it's it's an amazing piece of work so i'm so excited to have have you here um these books have been a big part of my life so could you tell us a little bit about how you kind of got into wine in general and then how you, how you got to be working on these books with Jancis robinson and, and Bouillemoge for the the wine grapes sure um i wish i could say i had one of those um damascene moments with uh, you know, some amazing bottle of wine and my life changed completely, but I'm, I'm afraid I don't have that story to tell you. Uh, it was very much more gradual than that. I, I've always enjoyed wine my, in my family. Uh, my father liked wine, but he didn't know that much about it. He was interested. He, I think he had a copy of the second edition of the World Atlas of Wine. And he and my mother used to like going on holiday and bringing back a case or two of not very expensive wine just because they wanted to buy it locally. So they were by no means wine experts and uh, they drank wine maybe once a week. So there was a, a little bit of background, but not, much, not, not a serious background. And then um, at university, I drank wine like most people, um, met a few friends who knew a bit more than I did. And that actually is the pattern, is meeting people who knew more than I did and thinking, oh, I'd really like to know a bit more. And the key... The key thing underneath it all was, I think if I know more, I'll enjoy it more. So it was always about wanting to enjoy the wine more, being more adventurous, being able to take more risks, because I knew a bit more. It was never about just knowing the information. It was it, There was always um, an ulterior motive, and the ulterior motive was pleasure. So um, that's really the, the story, that's the thread behind the story. Um, I lived in Bristol for a while in southwest England and I started uh, thinking oh, I think I might do a little evening class about wine and I went to this first class it was to for the very first level of the wine and spirit education trust and I went to this class it happened to be in the afternoon and the other people there were people who worked at hotels who didn't seem terribly interested you know to be quite honest and they 
this guy started talking. He wasn't particularly charismatic, but he started talking about wine, and I was completely blown away. And I thought, wow, this is the most amazing product under the sun. And uh, the other interesting thing was during that course, he used some of Jancis Robinson's um, wine course uh, episodes that had been aired on uh, television in the UK as uh, part of the, his means of presenting. So I'd always been um, exposed to the, the material that Jancis had produced. And I used to buy her, I used to buy the Financial Times newspaper only for her column on wine. I used to throw the rest of it away and read her column. Uh, so it was that process with the Wine and Spirit Education Trust courses, then I did the next one. And then I had the um, cheek, I think is the best word, to contact Jancis Robinson. And I wrote to her and I said, um, I really like the way you write. I'm really interested in wine. I'd really like to meet you. And um, much to my amazement, she said yes. So uh, I went up to London from Bristol and asked her advice about how I could possibly move from working on um, editing uh, educational books, which was what I'd been trained in. Um, um, I studied French and German at university. I'm a linguist, but I edited um, all sorts of educational books for different publishers. And so I said, how can I transfer from language teaching books to wine books? So we, she welcomed me into a house. We had a chat and uh, she gave me some ideas. And as I left, I said, well, you know, what I'd really like to do is work for you. And uh, she, she sort of laughed and said, um, oh, I'm never going to employ anybody. I'm a control freak. And um, so that was that. Um, except uh, we kept in touch and she actually asked me to do a, a job for her, a freelance job, which was, uh, con um, what's the word, concentrating the Oxford Companion down into a concise Oxford Companion, which meant taking out about two thirds of the words. So I did that as a freelance um, and uh, then I carried on um, doing my studies, working as an editor, and uh, eventually I got, um, I got through to my diploma. I got a scholarship to work with a small supermarket chain who have a very good uh, range of wines called Waitrose. And uh, while I was there, I ran the press tastings, which meant I stayed in touch with Jancis. And they also put me through my Master of Wine qualifications. So that was really the process from but it was a lot to do with education, but always education with a view to pleasure. And but always also that contact with Jancis uh, that I kept uh, kept in, just kept in touch, always had a hope that maybe she'd change her mind. And uh, it actually took seven years from my very first saying to her, I'd really like to work for you, to actually working for her full time. Seven, seven years of uh, perseverance and cheek. Yeah, so that's. That's crazy. Well, number one, that shows that persistence pays off Two, um, So like, can you give us a, a little bit of a sense of like the time period was were you when you went to work with her? Did you go work on Jancis Robinson like dot com or Purple Pages? Was that your first kind of intro or were you specifically working with her on on the books first? How did what was your first kind of employment with her like? Um, well, it was in uh, I think it must have been 2004. Um, I just passed my Master of Wine uh, exams and the dissertation, and um, I had I'd been working part time. Um, I have to get the timeline right. There was um, I was working part time on the Oxford Companion, working with Jancis because I had that's right. I had um, contacted her when I passed my MW and said. Um, I hear you're doing a new edition of the Oxford Companion. That was number three. Now we're on five, but this was number three. And again, I just took all my courage in my hands and said, um, I've just passed my MW. Would you like some help with the Oxford Companion? I mean, who would say that except somebody desperate to persuade somebody? <laughs> um, but fortunately, she said yes. So I, I then persuaded my employer, uh, this company Waitrose, to let me go part time, so I did two years part time, uh, two thousand four, two thousand five, purely on the Oxford Companion, and part time working the other job. 
And then at the end of those two years, um, my employers said, we don't really like this idea of part time. It's either full time or nothing. So I said to Jancis, well, I have an ultimatum uh, from my employers. What do you think? And she said, yes, come and work full time for me. So that was December 2005. And she was just about to start work with Hugh Johnson on the next edition of the World Atlas of Wine. So I think I had two weeks off and uh, went to Chile and Argentina for the first time uh, on so-called holiday. But you know what those wine holidays are like. And um, came back, started work on the Wine Atlas. But because by that time uh, I was full time with Genesis, I was also writing on the website. So from that point on, from the end of 2005, it's always been a mixture of writing for JancisRobinson.com and then working on the books when the books were due needed to be revised. So it was always integrated with the two together. Because I, so I just want to back up. I'm sorry about that. Um, to talk about your dissertation, you kind of breeze breeze past on the master of wine, like finishing your master of wine. Can we take a step back and just have you tell us a little bit about what you wrote about um, for your final um, paper and sort of what what went into that process? Um, my original idea was to compare different types of ripening on particularly on Cabernet Sauvignon so I'd, I kept hearing people marketing people so telling me that their wines from for example the Uca Valley high up in uh, Argentina were so good because of the high t diurnal temperature range between daytime and nighttime temperatures so I began to wonder is it actually better or is it just that you can't make great wine if it's really hot all the time you know if you've got an equable climate such as Bordeaux uh, is that as good or better than one with a high diurnal temperature range so I presented this idea to the Institute of Masters of Wine and they said oh no it's much too complicated you can't do that you'll never get it done in 10,000 words and uh, six months or nine months so unfortunately I, I'd, I'd already done a bit of research. I'd been to um, California, I'd been to visit uh, Paul Draper at Ridge, done some research in Bordeaux, been to Argentina, and uh, had to completely change the plan. And unfortunately, I, I had to do something much more boring. So I looked at the uh, question of different types of wines produced in the Loire Valley, much easier to get to from the UK, and how they got to market in the, in the UK. So it was a much more of a marketing distribution wine style question rather than a technical one. Um, but I suppose it was more manageable. I had to accept it was maybe more chance of passing um, than the really complicated ripening one, but less interesting. Well, ha have you come back to that question since then? Uh, do you have any long form writing uh, on that topic? Uh, yeah, since, since Sadly then? not. I think it requires a book. And see, yeah. a lot more time and more time than I've got on top of the day job. Uh, it, but it's always in the back of my mind. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. I think it it certainly is like to, to properly flesh it out and explore even the nuances between so many regions that, you know, grow Cabernet Sauvignon now. So so many people try um, regardless if it grows well there or not. Um, so I, I think that would be that'd be fascinating. We'll stay tuned for that one. Um, well, do we want to pivot a little bit now that we have a sense of your background? Actually, I have one question before we get on to the Oxford, the fifth edition of the Companion to Wine. Um, how was, well, I guess you can't say if you have a favorite, but how was writing, writing wine grapes? And is um, uh, Vuillermoz as cool as he sounds from all the interviews and stuff that I've, I've heard? Um, he sounds like the, just like the coolest guy to hang out with or work with. Absolutely, yes. I mean, I think we made a, quite an interesting uh, trio. Um, we The really amazing thing was that in the period of four years that it took us to write the book, because um, there's such a big difference starting from scratch and doing a new edition, and this was starting from scratch. Nobody had ever written a book of that length and depth before, and um in that period of four years, I think we were in the same room 
twice. And all the rest of the communication was by email. Wow. Um, so we had an initial meeting to discuss it. And the, the original idea that Jose had was um, to do something like the top I don't know, 20 grape varieties. And uh, gradually that morphed into every single grape variety being commercially made into wine and bottled and sold commercially. So um, it did, there was quite a gestation of the idea of the book. And uh, it, what the best thing about working the three of us together was that we all had our strengths, I would say. So Jose was, was brilliant on all the DNA, also uh, very good on researching the etymology of wine names and the family relationships. And uh, then between us, Jancis and I would cover where it was grown, what the wines were like. And we'd also pull in Jose's experience because we we had the three of us, our, all of our tasting experience, um, producers, wines that we tasted, and uh, just bringing all three uh, different networks of connections, tasting experiences, travel experiences, made a really strong team. But we all had a very clear roles that we had within that team. But yeah, Jose's very cool. He's got very cool hats. <laughs> oh, that's that's awesome i'll have to try to find some photos of him now uh cool well i will think of him now with hats on when i read the book but um cool so let's get to the um oxford companion to wine fifth edition um something i didn't realize when i had first even started reading this is that there are other oxford companions to other things so could you explain briefly to our audience since they're mostly an american audience what what the oxford companion to you know, anything is kind of, and then kind of what it is for wine and what the, the main goal of it is? Um, I, I can't tell you which the first Oxford companions were, but they probably were things like English literature, music, philosophy. Um, there's now a lot of Oxford companions to something. Um, there's classical literature, American literature, law, American law. Uh, world mythology, food, cheese. There's all sorts of topics now. It's got much, got a much become a much bigger series. Um, but it's it's really. Uh, it, I think it takes the idea of the authoritativeness of the Oxford English Dictionary, and brings a subject matter into that idea of. Um, depth and breadth and, and a um, detailed, accurate authority on a particular topic. But um, the other key thing, and that's key to the Oxford Companion, is the contributors. So we can't write, we can't write this book without the contributors. They are our gold, if you like. So some of the entries would be written by the editors, um, and in this edition, I've just mentioned this edition, um, uh, Jancis handed the baton to me to be the lead editor. Uh, she was still um, strongly involved. She covered about 10% and did covered certain topics that she wanted to do. And then for this edition, for the first time, we brought on board uh, Tara Thomas, uh, who was the executive editor of Wine and Spirits for, I think, nearly 25 years. So what we what we really appreciated was not only Tara's expertise as an editor um, but also her perspective being a North American a North American with with a European passion uh, I would probably say you know she's a very um, she's probably a fairly European North American but she's still a North American and has all of the understanding of living there, the the language. I mean, that was a big thing when, between me and Tara was making sure that we understood each other. And uh, I didn't use any English, British English language that I might, not, between us, Jancis and I on a previous edition might not have realised that something we were saying was very British. And Tara would say, well, what does that mean? You know, we don't say that. And, and vice versa. So I hope very much that one of the other one of the things that we've really gained with Tara, apart from her, her great network of contacts and the brilliant way she's managed all the geographical entries, is her uh, her North American perspective, and I think that's made the book much more international, less 
less British maybe or less European. Did was that the question? Did I answer the question? Yeah, that was perfect. No, I think that was. I I hadn't hadn't really thought about that. I've 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 leafed through and and read a number of entries so far, and I, I thought they were really approachable. And I did notice more of a geographical focus and we have some questions coming up on that. So I think that that makes sense. Um, yeah. Can you just maybe sorry, just, just to, just to go back to mm -hmm. the, um, the question of what a companion is. Um, yeah. I think one thing that we've tried to do is, is to bring uh, balanced coverage, but without it being so balanced, it's bland and dull. So we try to keep a, a voice an editorial voice and sometimes the contributors have have their own voices um, depending on their uh, first language but trying to bring that authoritative approach but without it being dry and dull um, and the one of the other keys I think to this book is the cross references and I believe those are used in other companions because it's such a complex an interwoven subject wine there are so many entries where you really need to look at something else in order to understand that entry and you can't keep repeating yourself so it's it's a really tightly knit book with references to all sorts of entries and it takes you on a wild goose chase around the book sometimes you, you start reading one entry and two hours later you think oh, how did I get here and you've just been <laughs> following cross references oh a hundred a hundred percent um I, I think I've probably told my fiance a number of times, like I, that's one of my, my only qualms with the book is I, when you pick it up to look up one thing to your exact point, you end up like way away from what you were originally looking up. And then by the time you're done, you're like, you forgot the answer to the first thing you were looking up in the first place. <laughs> but it's, it's so cool because everything is so interesting when you, when you start diving in and there are things that you would never have thought were related. Um, but I will say, so can we, taking one step back though, so the, the Ox, Oxford Companion to Wine, I've, I think I read a description saying it was trying to organize it like a dictionary, but have like the, the editorial components and kind of the descriptions like an uh, encyclopedia. So it's really kind of a book that's meant to not only touch on a range of topics and be a reference guide, but also kind of give you additional color and insight into whatever the, the topic you want to learn more about. Is that is that kind of a succinct way to describe it? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a very good way to describe it. it. It's trying to, we've tried to cover every aspect of wine and the wine world. Um, I'm not saying we've succeeded, we try. And t um, every every uh, edition brings in new things, which they could be something has changed, or it could be we suddenly think, oh, we should have included this in the last edition. And every edition gets better and better. And poor Jancis on the first edition, she was working with 800 blank pages. Can you imagine starting with that? And what's more, no email. Everything came in on fax or paper post. And uh, I think, I believe there was somebody at Oxford University Press who transcribed things and sent them to Jancis. And she was working on, on a, some sort of rudimentary word processor, I think. And trying to do that now, you know, it would be, we sort of have such a luxury of the internet, email. Um, so, so yes, it's, it's, uh, it's getting, I think it's getting broader and deeper, but then the difficulty is you, you can't, they don't, you don't have limitless pages. You have to keep it concise. Yeah. The, I think one thing that, when you look at a book that's mainly uh, like most wine books that are mainly used for reference, um, there's sometimes a component of you miss the storytelling, right? And so I think like the the combination of sort of this is a dictionary, but this is also an editorial, and you have those kind of like blurbs and outtakes and and almost like mini essays, um, incredibly helpful with weaving sort of the the total story together because when if you lose context of a story and you only focus on facts, especially in something like wine, you sort of miss the whole, the whole picture. Oh, exactly. And that's why we have um, the topics in the book are clearly viticulture, winemaking, packaging, people, 
brands, mm -hmm. history. It, it tries to be a, the world of wine rather than uh, the sort of book you might read if you were studying for an exam. Although I, I, I believe that lots right. of uh, um, students like myself use it for exams. I used it for exams. But we, we really hope it, it's readable enough. And as you say, it has the stories um, about people and what they do and, and what's changing in wine so that it's not just a, a reference book. It's actually one that you want to read. And that's why you keep going from entry to entry because you think, oh, I'd really like to know about uh, yeast. And then you read, the, you know, and then you think, oh, no, I'd really like to know about something else. And it just takes you on and or then it takes you to a country. You don't you don't stick with yeah. viticulture or winemaking. It takes you around the world of wine, which is, I think, makes it more readable and enjoyable. Well, and it helps you uh, introduce readers to, especially talking about new regions, new countries who maybe are coming into the spotlight because you can sort of say, you know, we, we know these stories and uh, of the producers and their wines and the legacy of their labels here. Uh, there's also something very similar going on in another country. Let me take you there and you can sort of tie everything together that way. Otherwise, it's just in Germany, they do this in Estonia. Now they're doing that. Um, so yeah, I really like that. I think it's a, it's a good way to, to bring people, like you said, around a tour of around the world. The other, um, the other piece I think is interesting when you're studying for an exam, I would say like your earliest exams, you learn a little bit about wine and you think, you know, everything. And then there's now that common saying, like the more you learn, the more you realize you don't know, um, I think this book is the epitome of that because you're like, ah, yes, like I want to look up this answer to tell somebody. And then you're like, ah, crap. And then by the time you're trying to explain <laughs> what the answer is, you're like, well, there's like 40 things I didn't know. Um, so <laughs> I'm less equipped. But no, I, I, I love that. Um, I think Brady's been the victim of some of those things. He asked me a simple question and then I give him the Oxford companion, but like the rundown, the rabbit hole answer. <laughs> um, Good, I'm glad so to hear it. <laughs> can we um well i want i want to talk about what's new in this edition um and what you guys kind of like focused on a little bit but first i still want to know uh, the contributors you i think there's like over a hundred is that right like how, how do you find these people how are they selected um and then yeah i guess i don't know how, how does it all come together in the end there um well for this edition the total number of contributors is 267 Wow. of which 100 are new to the fifth edition. So Jans has started out with a certain number of contributors. I don't um, honestly know how many there were, there were in the first edition. And um, then for every subsequent edition, there'd be a consideration if, um, for the existing entries, is that contributor still at the top of their game? Are they still working in that field? Um, or is there somebody else we'd like to refer to? And generally speaking, we would uh, go back to previous contributors. Sometimes they'd say, I think you should talk to so-and-so, not, not me anymore. Um, but for, for new entries, or if we felt that an entry needed uh, a bigger update, we would use, um, well, again, it's a bit like the Wine Grapes book. There's the three editors with very broad experience and many connections and many people and many networks so um, there would be our own experience there would then be a process of research so suppose for example um, I wanted I, I was wanted, writing a, um, an entry on underwater aging which was a new entry and so I would research look who was doing it who, who else I, I met I knew some people already but I didn't know everybody and I would contact them ask them what their feelings were and if I discovered that they were they'd done some scientific research I could get that information from them and then I found um, uh, an academic in, in Burgundy who would also looked at some of this topic and, and then I would contact him so it's a combination of the people we know the people we've come across and then research into who's writing about this who's at the top of the game who know, who is really and um, for geographical entries who's on the ground ideally and that's, I think, really improved this, this edition. We've had more local people rather than one person doing a whole area. It, um, North America is a really good example. California, we had 
it's, it's divided up and better covered by more people than one person trying to cover the whole thing, which was a big, big area to cover. So um, it's partly the people we already know and then the research that we do to try and find people who are, they could be academics, they could be um, practitioners, winemakers, uh, viticulturalists, sorry, viticulturists, um, journalists, uh, historians, uh, just about anybody who is the expert in that topic. Awesome. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Um, yeah, I, I think I'm a, I'm a sucker for wine history, so I, I love that component of this as well. Another another wine history book. I'm still working my way through Hugh Johnson's The Story of Wine. I listen to it in like snippets and I've been listening to it for like almost a year now. Um, still have like 11 hours <laughs> left, but <laughs> I'm in the 1700s now. It's great. Um, <laughs> um, so you, you, you've touched on a little bit of the new regions I, I or regions. Let's, let's talk about that. Some of the newer ones that are um, included in the book. And then maybe if you want to add a little bit of color about I don't know, maybe the, the climate change aspect or how some of these regions, have they traditionally grown grapes? Is it just now possible? Are they, were they marginal and now they're coming on? Um, yeah, like maybe, yeah, why now? I think, um, you know, you suggested linking it with climate change. That That's definitely true of some of the new wine regions. But actually, there's an awful lot of updates and changes that are related to climate change, not just new regions. But taking that first, um, for example, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. In the past, they've mainly done fruit wines. They haven't really had the climate to ripen grapes fully. Um, and another, an interesting example is um, Norway. I had about two sentences in the last edition and now has two really full paragraphs. So their climate change has allowed uh, producers to go or or creative people who are just really want to make wine to move to move further north. Um, also higher up, we've got uh, more about higher elevation wine growing in Bhutan and Peru, for example. Um, in, in Europe, uh, Brittany in France was really too cool before. So there's there's a lot of um, regions that are developing because of climate change, but. There's a lot of other entries that have changed or needed um, new entries because of climate change that are to do with um, viticulture and winemaking. So there's climate change and, and regions. There's also our response to climate change. For example, um, uh, sustainability entries, regenerative viticulture uh, entry, uh, carbon footprint of wine, all these sort of things, geotextiles to help in really cold climates. It's not just the heat. Um, different grape varieties being developed or moving to new regions because they cope better with drought or heat. So there's an awful lot of entries, as well as the entries that are actually about climate, that tie into the, the changing world, uh, the changing environmental world we live in, but also our response to it, as I said, sustainability. And then you'd have... Um, entries about packaging, which are also related to sustainability, which is goes back to the environment. You know, there are so many in in the same way that the book is so interconnected. Many of the changes in the wine world are are interconnected as well. Brady, did you want to hop in there? I feel like I've been monopolizing the conversation. Oh, uh, just no, that's, that's okay. The, just going back to the question of new uh, regions, um, we've also got um, new entries on uh, some uh, uh, African countries, Gabon, Senegal, Uganda. And there, I don't think it's really anything to do with climate change. It's just to do with people's creativity and ingenuity. They think, oh, we, why don't we make, we could make wine here. So we just trying to make sure that we are aware of what people are doing and, and I mean, like Gabon, I remember somebody just mentioning it to me and I thought, oh, really? You make wine in Gabon? And so sometimes it's just a, it's lucky that we've heard about it because you don't always really come across some of these countries and winemaking. Um, so it's not entirely climate change, but to be honest, most of the 
most of the changes in the book are related to it in terms of regions, but also things like um, pests and diseases. Uh, Pierce's disease has for a long time been a big problem in uh, Southern California. And in recent years, it's been found in olive trees uh, in Southern Europe. And now also, unfortunately, I think in Mallorca in vines. So uh, that is, again, is related, I think, but I believe to be related to climate change, also to globalization, the way that everything gets taken everywhere. There's no, there are no borders anymore. Um, but where, where, um, where diseases are spread and then, uh, the other aspect would be, uh, then you have to think about entries to talk about how you control diseases. And that goes in, could be in two directions. It could be um, breeding great varieties that will uh, adapt better to, uh, will be more resistant to pests and diseases. They have better resistance, for example, to powdery mildew, downy mildew in particular. Um, and then you've got the, the varieties that particularly Bread, the peewee, so-called peewee varieties, um, and that requires an extension in the book of, of those. They were covered a bit before, but we had to expand that because that's a big area of research. Um, so it's almost impossible to, to tear apart the topics and to explain why one area is updated because there's so many connections. And then you've got all the, the, the way people change their drinking styles and whether they want to drink lower alcohol wine um, and the, the the language that they use you know we didn't have an entry before on glue glue we have a glue glue entry for gluggable easy drinking wines um, so it's it's also in language another entry new one is celebrity wine I mean that's got nothing to do with climate change but mm. nobody talked about celebrity wine 10 years ago um, sorry I'm, I'm going off a tangent but I'll, I'll hand back to you that's all right well, I, I mean, I, the, the first question that came to mind as you were talking, but now I want to talk about celebrity wine. <laughs> the, the the first question um, that I had was sort of of these, maybe when new regions come online or you explore, um, you know, the practices, a place like Gabon or Senegal um, or even Uganda, do you notice any sort of similarities as these emerging regions come online in terms of um, maybe similarities in the challenges that they face? Um, or kind of, is that all different and varied or do you see any similarities in terms of what sort of demand is sort of driving interest in those areas? Um, you know, for instance, one type of, of drinker is, is really increasing in terms of, of consumption and the wines of a particular emerging region sort of suit that demographic or yeah. What can you say about the similarities of, of the ones that are sort of emerging in this space right now? I would say the main driver is individuals who think, why don't we make, we could make wine here. Most mm -hmm. of the obstacles would be climatic, I would say, water, uh, heat, or in some areas, uh, so for example, this isn't a new area, but Thailand, uh, humidity, and having to manage whether you have two crops a year or one crop a year. So I think the challenges would, would be almost entirely climatic. Um, I wouldn't, I don't think the market question is, is the biggest question with these new areas. I don't think there's a, everybody's saying, oh, well, I really want to yeah. try a wine from Uganda. I think it's more coming from individuals who think we could really make, we could make good wine here. Um, so it's more, I think it more about there. maybe like opportunity and then the resources to sort of take action in those areas. So is there like, has there been more outside investment or... I'm just wondering who's in Senegal, for instance, you know, sitting around on Monday saying, oh, we should start growing grapes, then starts doing that on Friday. Is there outside capital coming in or is or is there really like sort of a grassroots movement in some of these countries to uh, sort of pick I up and, it, and start exploring that? I think I, I don't think you can generalize. I think it's a bit of both. There may be a grassroots, but okay. they probably need some investment or, or some sure. um, investment, either financially or in terms of uh expertise in viticulture mm. uh, i know that um some of the uh work done in tropical climates um has been really uh supported by uh, two guys who are in from geisenheim in germany so you might be in investing uh, knowledge 
as well as as finances. But yeah. I don't think there's a one answer to that question. I think it's very much uh, local to the area. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I wonder if um, timing, just in like a geopolitical realm, is is having an impact too. Because I, I imagine that some of these countries that maybe got, you know, post colonial era got their independence in the middle 1900s 1900s sometimes maybe there was like a pushback against wine and now it's been kind of long enough where it's kind of viewed as something they could own rather than something that you know people who previously came and it might have brought it um i wonder if that's kind of a, a potential impact and maybe some of the african countries at least um, um I, think it, I think it could be i I'm, i don't think i know enough to to really say that for each each of those i don't know enough about the, the country and the you know uh, a fairly Restricted entry about the winemaking doesn't really. I haven't got the history and the, like, say, the colonial history um, to answer that. Yeah, me, me neither. But now, now you have me thinking, and I'm like, oh, maybe, maybe there is like these amazing, you know, Grand Cru like parcels that we just don't know about because nobody's ever farmed them. They're going to come online. That would be amazing. Also, I'll let Brady ta ask his um, celebrity question. But I will say, um, in our area, uh, with I live in. Los Angeles and where I am, there's a lot of these quote unquote natural wine bars. And uh, you, like there is actually a wine just called glue glue. And it's so funny how people that, you know, I, I had learned the term just by reading when my studies, but now like it's almost common vernacular amongst people who don't even really drink wine, what glue glue is. And I just think it's hilarious. So I think it's definitely um, necessary for the the companion because you have non, non serious wine drinkers walking around asking for glue glue at restaurants. So I think that's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> but it's interesting though because I don't think it's quite as common in the UK as it is in the US. Yeah, well, also you guys have the term quaffable, and I don't think anybody here understands that. But when they want something <laughs> that's easy to drink without thinking, they say like glue glue or you know something like that. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. um, yeah, my celebrity wine question. Just wonder what the the, the perspectives were that you guys kind of because uh, I haven't seen that section in the book. Um, yeah, what can you kind of share with the audience? Sort of what was the approach to first, why did you include a section on celebrity wines and sort of what was the approach to providing information in that space and what's the kind of perspective shared? Um, you know, we have to every time I am um, every time we finish a book, uh, an edition of the Oxford Companion, as soon as the text goes to the printer. I start a file about corrections or updates for the next edition. So for about eight years, I'm compiling this massive document that we then have to go through at the beginning of the next edition. So we would go through, we have a list of all the headwords of the previous edition on a spreadsheet with who, who the contributor was, how many words it was, um, and then we have to go through and think uh we should are there any entries that we don't want to keep which is rare but it happens um and then what are what are the new entries but then i have to go through this document and think are there any areas in here that need to be in the book and that would be things that i've read about or we've read about um, or have heard about and so if something has become currency in in the language like celebrity wine and it's something that's become more uh, common then it's something we has to go in the book because that's what it's it's a, a phrase that people use um, mm -hmm. so so that's how it came about and then we just look around and see who's doing it yeah I think there's we've had I guess a couple of different conversations at different times on the podcast about the um, both influence that celebrity wine, celebrity quote unquote winemakers or celebrity backed labels um, have on the industry and people's perception maybe of a region or a certain variety. Um, I guess this is most mostly a phenomenon in terms of the coverage uh, in, in the companion in in um, North America. Is that right? Or is this something that also see a lot of in Europe as well? I think it would be dominated by North America. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Yeah. There are definitely some quote unquote celebrity wines who are uh, really advancing a region and a 
variety forward in like new markets. And then there are others who uh, it's very obviously sort of just a, like a branding deal or some kind of cash grab that way and not really taking the wine that seriously. Well, I think it's mostly a branding deal, but there's some where they actually care about yeah. they care about the wine. Yeah. Do you think it's a good thing, celebrity wine? I I think insofar as it gets more people to drink wine, whatever the quality, um, I think that's the first step, right? Um, get more people to drink bad wine <laughs> or wine at all, right? And then uh, eventually uh, they can, um, yeah, sort of progress through. So I guess that's the 10,000 foot view is as long as more people are drinking, it's good. On the other hand, um, sometimes those labels can overshadow um, you know, other produ smaller producers, maybe with less capital or less you know, distribution because of follower status or celebrity or things like that. Um, and so that can maybe be a shame, um, in certain regions, but, um, I think at the end of the day, in terms of quality, um, in the wine world as, you know, experts and enthusiasts, uh, quality on the long term will rise to the top. So I'm not as concerned about that. And I think so probably the positive of more people drinking likely outweighs it a bit for me. Mm. And it, you made me, uh, I've just remembered uh, one of the entries that we did take out, um, mm -hmm. which ha has quite, it's quite an interesting comparison. It was cool. It was uh, critter labels. Do you remember critter labels? Critter. It started like, off yeah, with like, um, like little, yeah, like yellow, yeah, like yellowtail, like has a kangaroo, exactly. just having uh, a kangaroo. Yeah. 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 Started off with yellowtail, and it was there was a whole rash of animals, and uh, okay. they were very popular. Maybe they were the predecessors of celebrity wine. But, um, Interesting. That's I think, funny. You know, I agree. It's good to get people drinking wine, but I also think it's a shame if um, they stick with the celebrity wine and don't branch out. But then I think that's sure. a shame with 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 any any um, any instance where someone just always drinks the same wine and doesn't have the confidence or isn't encouraged to try something different. Because for me, the best thing about wine is it's diversity and the fact that yeah. I'll never, ever try everything. And uh, if, if yeah. I limited myself to one or two wines, I think that would be a shame. I'd be depriving myself of a huge amount of pleasure. And I feel that for people who do stick with one or two celebrity wines. Um, I think it's great to try them, but, you know, just don't stick with them. I think there's probably a, uh, a factor around pricing that's at play there. Um, cause I don't know anyone who, you know, is drinking, uh, just say $75 celebrity wine and that's all they drink. Right. Mm. So these celebrity wines maybe are 30 or uh, $25 and below or $30 and below. And maybe they're only drinking in that space, but, um, you know, it's, it's hard for smaller producers to compete at some of those price points, depending on the variety and region and stuff, but it's hard for smaller producers to compete at those price points. And so I feel like the only hope is that that consumer gets more interested and then also maybe increases the amount that they're willing to spend on a particular wine to actually get them out of that sort of celebrity wine funk or, you know, the, sort of the pattern of only drinking those wines, like you're saying is, yeah, I do agree that it's not where you want people to stay, but yeah. Yeah. yeah if it's, it's, a, if it's, it's an introduction, that's great. Agreed. If there's, um, I don't know if you've heard of the book Wine Wars, um, Wine Wars 1 and 2, this guy, Mike Veseth, um, V-E-S-E-T-H, he goes in, he's like, calls himself the wine economist and he goes into the nuances of, of uh, celebrity wines is also, I think he touches on the critter labels. Um, and he says there's like two camps in wine, the ter terroirists who are like, you need to be like appreciating wine and enjoying it and like telling the full story where it's like, there, there's the other camp who's just trying to get more people to drink wine um, in general. And then that's better for the macro wine industry. Um, it's an interesting, I, I, you could go on, like, obviously he wrote two books about this. So I think it's, it could go on forever. Um, but um, recommended if people want more reading on that topic um outside of you know get your um out oxford companion to wine and then add this as a supplement he um he also has not wanted to come on the podcast so mike if you're listening come on um <laughs> <laughs> for the um so pivoting looking forward now a little bit since we're gonna get close here on time and we don't want to keep you too long 
for over the next what five to ten years, um, kind of what what are you what trends are you seeing now that you expect to kind of snowball and kind of grow, um, or is there anything you're seeing now that you think might might peter out and and not really be worthy of noting as much in the the next version of the Oxford Companion? Um, I think the trends that we're seeing now, some of them we've touched upon, which is uh, the need for greater sustainability in and I know that word is used very vaguely, but I guess I'm talking about uh, better stewardship of the the land um, and the um, attempts made to, for example, to increase carbon sequestration, carbon capture from fermentation, for example, uh, reducing the cost of transport by using bulk packaging, uh, bulk transport or lighter packaging i think all those things are, are going to continue because that's the way our world is moving and we've, we've got to keep um combating the uh, uh the effects of climate change um i think also the development of grape varieties that have better resistance to uh, diseases fungal diseases in particular i think um i'm not sure how how well they will do i i think there's because they're not genetically modified they're typically uh using genetic technology but not genetic modification or they're bred over many years um to incorporate a little bit of uh, the genetics of a non-vinifera a vitis vinifera variety um i think i think all those techniques will be more and more important because we will have to have great varieties that will cope better with climate change. Also, I think um, better understanding of what grows where, what can grow where, the the moving of maybe some uh, varieties from uh, really hot or Mediterranean climates that could grow outside of those regions that are well adapted to drought and heat, that sort of thing. Um, moving uh, when you're planting, planting in, in uh, cooler regions, different elevation, different north facing in, in in the northern hemisphere for example as opposed to south facing so all these things i think they will increase and also i mean consumption trends uh people are drinking less generally consumption is going down there's uh in the news at the moment is all the need to um in in southern france and bordeaux for example pull up vineyards there's there's too much capacity um there's more there's more um, wine available than there is that's been being drunk so all these things are going to play into uh, how people drink, what people drink. Plus, all the thing we haven't talked about is health and uh, lower lower alcohol or even no alcohol wines. I think those are going to continue more. There's a greater emphasis than ever, I think, on people's awareness of their health and alcohol, and that's something that I think we'll need more and more careful investigation because it's very very difficult to assess. Uh, all of the information that you hear and all the research that's done into wine and health it's it's a lot of it seems contradictory and quite difficult to pull together so um i think that would be another another side of things that um i hope maybe also growing continuing interest in local small uh rather than big conglomerate type wine companies i i, I think that's maybe that's more of a hope than a expectation um and then continuing to to fight against diseases that are really spreading, like trunk diseases like uh, ESCA, or um, they're really causing problems in everywhere, but, but huge areas of, of Europe that are struggling with ESCA and whether to whether you have to pull out the vineyard, replant, whether you can uh, cut, cut out the, the dead wood, all these sort of research, finding the best solutions, all these things will inform up to updates. It's a never ending awesome. job. <laughs> so, as soon as you finish one edition, you've got to start revising it for the next edition. You could do a companion on each region <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and still update it every year. <laughs> yeah. 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 Julia, thanks. Thanks so much for coming on and, um, and, uh, chatting with us. I think there's probably, like I said, we could go, section by section and and break down um yeah 
the entire companion appreciate all the work that you've done both uh in supporting other writers and also you know uh, yourself and putting together such a wealth of information out there um hopefully more wine drinkers graduate to digesting uh this kind of material and, and not even graduate but see it as something that's accessible for themselves to to continue their wine journey well i hope so and i hope people think of it as it, it looks quite daunting but it's actually something you can dip in and out of you don't have to read it from cover to cover so um yeah you, you can take little steps into a big book yeah that's Your the bridge version. dipping in yeah. <laughs> yeah dipping in and then staying there accidentally for an hour um also also you guys have the oxford companion if you want like just quick research on the on the website as well on on jansus robinson that's kind of my on the go version when i can't bring the book with me everywhere um but also like i think i don't know if i'm is as much in the last version i didn't compare page to page but there's a lot of beautiful visuals in this version too um and, and helpful helpful things to um give further color to things so i think that's really also a huge um benefit for anybody trying to learn so yeah again thank you so much for joining and uh we appreciate your time thank you i've enjoyed talking to you awesome well cheers all right that was our interview with julia harding i hope everybody kind of got a little bit of insight into how these books are made how many people um, and how much time actually goes into creating something so thorough and extensive. Um, and she's already hard at work at on the on the sixth edition, <laughs> which don't worry if you get this one, they don't come out for a number of years at a time. So you'll be good for for many years, but you should go get the fifth edition. Now I have it. It's beautiful, highly recommended. Um, but yeah, that is our episode for this week. We'll be back with another interview and another episode next week. Cheers. To check out our current offerings and to sign up for the Vint platform, find us at www.vint.co. That's www.vint.co. For questions, comments, or feedback on the Vint podcast, please email us at support at vint.co. Vint and VV Markets are offering securities pursuant to Regulation A. Our offering circular is amended can be found on the SEC website. Past performance is no guarantee of future results. Investments such as those on the Vint platform are speculative and involve substantial risks to consider before investing. We may provide communication that may contain certain forward-looking statements that are subject to various risks and uncertainties. Information provided in any communications, including this podcast, is not legal, business, or tax advice. All prospective investors should consult a legal, tax, or business advisor concerning the subject matter of any communications and any offering.